हरि ओंदक्षरमदस्योपव्यख्यान भूतं भविष्यदिसमोकार यच्चान्यत्रिकालाथीतंथाप्यंकार आरिहि आं आं the word is all this a clear explanation of it is the following all that is past present and future is verily aum that which is beyond the triple conception of time is also truly aum as all these objects that are indicated by names are non different from the names as understood from the standpoint of the mind which explains everything perceived or cognized as only a form of thought and as names are non different from aum so aum is verily all that cognized by the mind and as the supreme brahman is known through the relationship subsisting between names and their objects it too is but aum dasya of that aum that is the same as the supreme as well as the inferior brahman upavakyanam a clear exposition showing its proximity to brahman by virtue of its being a means for the attainment of brahman the expression is to be understood as started with has to be supplied to complete the sentence bhutam the past bhavat the present bhavishyat the future its whatever is circumscribed by the three conceptions of time sarvam aunkareva all this is but aun according to the reasons already advanced chayat trikalatikam and whatever else there is beyond the three periods of time that is inferable from its effects but is not circumscribed by time for example the unmanifested and the rest tatapi that too is aunkareva verily aun namaste So this is the first verse of the Upanishad. We'll go through several of these verses and then we'll get into the Karika or the commentary on the Upanishad. And Shankaracharya has written a commentary on every single verse both of the Upanishad and the Karika. 215 verses altogether. Now The point where this Upanishad starts is with Aum. Aum Kar means the letter Aum. So the letter Aum is a merger of three other letters: A, U, and N. And it has to be pronounced like that, not Aum, but Aum. all three letters and each of them is long which means it gets a full matra a full beat of rhythm it's not just om but aum like that and when you hear really good chanters that's the way they chant aum and we've been over this a bunch of times on this channel every time we reach a passage in one of the scriptures that explains om they explain it in the same way so how is it that in modern yoga classes and stuff like that it's become simply om uh, no nasal ending no beginning with a uh, you know even though the symbol for om it's very clear that it's based on a uh, and u and then the anuswara which means the nasal ending um 
He goes up the nose to the third eye. So anyway, this ohm is identical with everything. All perceptions, whether from the world, which means the three stages of time, past, present, future, or beyond the world, for example, emptiness, nothingness, the unmanifested, and so on. Things that are not within the world, not subject to the purview of time. All of those things are identical with Aum. Now, in his purport, in his Tika, Shankaracharya clearly mentions this is only true on the mental platform. Why? Because actually words are different from the things they represent and from each other as well. But as far as qualitatively, in our model of reality, which is made with words, the different letters are pretty much identical. And all of them are coming from Aum. We went over this back in the Matrika series. If you want to get deep into how, why, and how come, and how does it work, and what does it mean? Well, we're just going to accept what Shankara says here as the basis for understanding this Upanishad. Because Aum, both the letter and the concept of Aum, is very important to the whole Vedas. Every Vedic mantra begins and ends with Aum. If you listen to really good mantra reciters, Vedic reciters, they're chanting Aum at the beginning of every line, whether it's there in the printed or, or not. Doesn't make any difference. Every mantra should begin with Aum. If it doesn't, means it's missing and it has to be supplied. So not only that, he says everything that can be cognized by the mind is Aum, or is in Aum, or is related with Aum. So this is very important because if we have an ontology or a model of reality in our mind that is based on the truth, then we can accurately predict the consequences of everything. We can reason and come to the same conclusions as the Vedas. In other words, our model is realistic, true to form, true to actual reality. And that is only true if our model has a transcendental nature. And the key to the transcendental nature is Aum. Aum is the basis because Aum is identical with both the Supreme and the inferior Brahmans. That's what he says on the second page of the Tika. So to give a clear exposition of the meaning of Aum is the purpose of actually this whole first chapter. Actually, the whole Upanishad. Well, the Upanishad is only 12 verses. So what? how much can it say, right? <laughs> well, it explains that Aum has four parts. And these four parts, or quarters, are the four states of consciousness. So we're going to get into that in detail in the upcoming episodes. You've all seen our chart, right? The four states of consciousness. Well, this is where it comes from. Mandukya Upanishad is the source, is the authority for these four states of consciousness. And once you really absorb this knowledge, it makes everything so clear. Everybody, every day, is experiencing these four states of consciousness, actually simultaneously. Of course, we think, or we like to think, <laughs> that we're only in one of them at a time. Either we're waking, or we're dreaming, or we're in deep sleep, or we're enlightened. But that's not true. If we observe ourselves, 
very carefully and deeply without any bias, we come to the conclusion or we, we see directly that all four of these states are going and available all the time in everyone. It's just a matter of how you direct your attention, which one seems to be dominant at any moment. So these four states of consciousness are basic to everything else. Without consciousness, there is nothing else. So consciousness is the world, and consciousness is Aum. Aum is the four states of consciousness. So it's basic to all phenomena, because all phenomena depend on consciousness. And without consciousness, they have no existence at all, not even relative existence. So for the purposes of this chapter, at least, we're going to accept that names are equal to the things they represent, at least in the mind, as far as our mental model of reality is concerned, our ontology, our uh, terministic screen, and that for all practical purposes, the terms, the words, are identical with the things they represent. That allows us to reason in such a way that we can come to the same conclusions as the Vedas, that Brahman is supreme, and Brahman is all that exists in reality. Everything else that seems to exist is simply Maya. Now, this is the basic conclusion from which the Vedas descend, because Vedic knowledge is Avaroha, Avaroha Panta means the descending path, the path of deductive reasoning. So if we start with the highest truths, Aum is everything, then we can deduce the four states of consciousness and all phenomena based on them, which is basically everything. So when we use reason properly, we conclude the same thing as is stated in the Vedas. When we use it improperly, we come up with some other conclusion. So this Upanishad is going to use reason, and especially the Karika, the commentary on the Upanishad, uses reason to explain how all these conclusions are derived. And that is the real value of this Upanishad, and its commentary. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shaktihi Aum. Aum Namashivaya. <laughs>